have a chance to join us yesterday uh, to our conference on the Arab Spring in comparative perspective. Um, uh, we had a terrific, terrific start, I thought, yesterday uh, with the two panels on democratization and um, uh, justice, human rights issues, and we're on to um, uh, additional um, uh, terrific panels this afternoon, this morning and this afternoon. Um, let me just say on behalf of the Wilson Center, a warm welcome uh, from the Global Europe program, which <coughs> I direct, but also from my partners in crime here internally. Uh, that is uh, the Mexico um, uh, project under uh, Duncan Wood, the Brazil project uh, <coughs> under Paulo Sotero, and the Middle East program under Jale Esfandiari, who will be joining us a little bit uh, later uh, this morning. Um, uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, my thanks to Ron Prisson uh, from the Monk School and our colleagues from AU, um, who have been just, just wonderful partners in organizing this joint effort, which, as, uh, as Ron mentioned yesterday, is not meant as a one-off, but really as the beginning of a larger, uh, longer-term conversation that we hope to continue uh, in, in, in other, perhaps even more fun places than, uh, than Washington. Um, <laughs> but uh, here we are, so um, uh, I wish us all a good, good session, good sessions today, and look forward to uh, learning a lot, as I did yesterday. So thank you. Over to Ron for... Sure. Just, uh, I'm tempted to just leave it at ditto, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, especially because you'll be hearing from me a little bit later in, in this panel as, as well. But, but I do think uh, even an additional word of, of welcome and appreciation is, uh, is in order. Um, uh, it's been wonderful working with, uh, with Christian and uh, people at the Wilson Center and getting the program organized as well, wonderful working with Jim Goldgeier and others at uh, American University. Jim would infinitely prefer to be with us today than doing what he is doing. He's, uh, as, as dean of, of the School of International Service, is stuck, and I don't think that's an inappropriate word, in an all-day meeting of senior administrators uh, at, uh, at American University. If you've been in any of those, you know he really would rather be here uh, with, with us. But uh, uh, I, I think uh, we're recording the proceedings. I'm sure he's going to follow, uh, follow up. So thank you for, uh, for coming at the beginning of uh, what we think is, is going to be a very interesting project. I told a couple of people that after the first session already yesterday afternoon, uh, Christian and Jim and I sort of met over a coffee break and said that's exactly what we hoped was going to happen in terms of bringing together people who don't necessarily usually talk to each other uh, about uh, some of these issues and the uh, comparative uh, possibilities uh, in terms of the experiences they all have expertise in and the particular possibilities of relevance to understanding uh, what's going on and to some degree what's not going on in what we've come to call uh, the, the Arab Spring. Uh, and I don't doubt that uh, today's uh, panels and concluding roundtable is going to confirm even more uh, the sense that this is a, a worthwhile uh, undertaking. And that's enough for me. Uh, please. Failed to and I, actually yesterday I said my thanks already, but Christina was sitting outside uh, doing other work. Um, a huge thanks from my end, from our end, to Christina Tertsieva who really did the heavy lifting on uh, the co the conference organization here. Many of you who've traveled here uh, know that firsthand. So let's give a round of applause to Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Christina, and also. Uh, our our uh, dedicated interns in the background and the staff, the AV staff, which is double shifting today um, because we have a big Wilson Center centennial uh, fund donor fundraising event going on um, uh, all day. And so if you'll see a, a lot of people in dark suits and ties running around here, be nice to them. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 our, our livelihoods depend on them. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Christian. And I think Christian also meant to say, be nice to them and also perhaps give them some money. Um, <laughs> my name is Michael Geary. I'm a, I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Centre uh, in the Global Europe Programme. And also, uh, I have a faculty position at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. 
Um, I will chair this session. So welcome again. Let me extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, this morning to uh, the first panel here at the Wilson Centre and the third panel of the conference <coughs> entitled External Pressures and Interventions. And this panel really is uh, covering many, many parts of the globe. So we, I won't spend too long with introductory remarks. Uh, each of our speakers will have about 10 to 15 minutes um, uh, or less, which, uh, as, as they please. And then we will have... Uh, <laughs> Uh, comments from, from my colleague here, um, Marina Ottaway, uh, and then followed by questions and answers from uh, the audience. Um, so we will start as the program uh, has dictated with our first, uh, pan with our first panelist discussions. Uh, Maitek uh, Bodoszynski from the State Department and Piotr uh, Kosicki from the University of Maryland and the Woodrow Wilson Centre. Um, we've already distributed quite lengthy um, biographical details for each of our panel speakers, so I won't, um, I won't go through them in, in huge detail. Um, my tech is not here this morning, um, but he is a foreign service officer with the State Department. Presumably he is in Libya since he's serving there, um, but uh, word has it that he will be transitioning back to the world of academia um, in the fall where he's starting a teaching position at uh, Pomona College. Um, uh, importantly, he is the author of Regime Change in the Yugoslav Successor States, Divergent Paths Towards a New Europe. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley and is also a former Fulbrighter. Um, his paper will be presented this morning um, by Piotr Kosicki, who is a colleague of ours here at the Wilson Centre and also at the University of Maryland. Uh, and Piotr focuses largely on a transnational history of the 20th century and is working on a very interesting book uh, between Catechism and Revolution, Catholic Europe and the Social Question 1878 to 1991, which uh, I believe will be finished by the end of this year. So we're looking forward to that um, uh, being published. And Piotr holds a PhD from, in history from Princeton. So I will now give the floor to Piotr. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks to Christian Osterman for bringing me in. I have taught for years the uh, uh, revolutions of 1989 in global historical perspective, so it's nice for me to be in the room uh, when a conference like this happens because while I have very little firsthand experience with the documentary base or with the languages, a lot of the places we've been discussing, I definitely feel involved in the issues. That said, I, uh, I, mean, I hope you've all had a chance to look at uh, Mieczysław Boduszyński's paper. Uh, he and I are both Polish. I think that's basically the extent of what we have in common, strictly speaking. <laughs> I work on neither Albania nor Libya, but for those of you who watch TV, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, I've made some notes for myself, actually, just on things that I'd like to highlight because I think they'll set up a, a very w brief segment of what Christian has suggested that I do, which is talk for a couple of minutes about uh, Mietek Boduszyński's paper and then give you a few thoughts of my own on Poland, actually. Yesterday was the uh, 24th anniversary of both the Tiananmen Square massacre and the semi-free elections in Poland on June 4th, 1989. So uh, in the spirit of that and the fact that both the person I'm replacing and I are of Polish origin, I figured why not bring Poland into the program. But a few things that I just wanted to highlight from Mietek's paper, uh, which really, I mean, I think the, the idea of conditionality and of aspirations for membership in external actors, when we're talking about involving an international context of transition or thinking about the inter -commu international community as a single or really range of actors in any kind of political or social transition is incredibly important. I think Mietek's paper really, I mean, it, it has several very important bullet points, but conditionality seems to be one of the take-home messages. He's very optimistic and very happy about the way that the transition in the Western Balkans went vis-a-vis -vis Western involvement, and he simply does not see any basis for that kind of thinking in the Arab Spring, and he enumerates a variety of reasons. But I think it's worth quoting two separate sentences from the first page of his paper because he constructed this nice parallelism. I didn't know if he even, I, I assume he did this intentionally. For the first, from his uh, first day in Albania 2005. On my first day at the embassy, I was told that what we were doing in Albania was no less than nation building. And then from his first day in Libya in 2012. On my first day at the embassy, I was told that the Western footprint in Libya would be light, and that the US and other Western actors would assist only when and where the Libyans requested help. 
Now, the core, really, of his paper involves thinking about leverage, Western leverage over democratization. I mentioned before the word conditionality, the idea of a certain kind of convergence on the part of the uh, regimes and societies in transition toward preset criteria. So we talk about Copenhagen criteria, among others, in the context of EU aspirations in the Balkans that, f to his mind, seems to be missing from the context of the Arab Spring. This is only one example that he brings up in the paper, but I think it's worth a fair amount of attention. Something that he starts out with is uh, the, the point of departure that really neither the Balkans nor the Arab Spring were a priori, seemed ripe for democratization, uh, at the point at which the transition started, economic underdevelopment, lack of democratic institutions and traditions, ethnic divisions, but at the same time, the place and role of foreign actors, whether we're talking about the United States, the OSCE, or the EU writ large, is uh, present in the Balkans, very different in the case of the Arab Spring. Uh, his central claim for the Balkans, I think this is worth discussing actually, it's a very provocative claim as far as I'm concerned, although it makes a lot of sense. Democracy would not exist in the Balkans if not for external leverage, right? Plain and simple, this is his claim. And he give, comes up with a variety of reasons for this. There's the hard power interpretation, which is obviously security needed to be exported to the Balkans because they were the doorstep of Europe, and it would A, look bad for Europe if security weren't exported, and B, uh, suggest really that it would uh, uh, also bring up a, a soft power reason, namely that there's a certain universalistic norm that the EU, the OSC, and the US were trying to promote as part of this notion of welcoming the Balkans back into Europe. Cemented in some sense by the fact that, as Mietek highlights, really most of the citizens of the Balkans already saw themselves as Europeans. So there was in some sense an aspiration of return or an aspiration of uh, confirmation of things that already seemed to them obvious in some sense on their own. And then the other key aspect that he highlights really is the fact, as I mentioned before, that there were Western boots on the ground that were willing to get involved. He highlights the high representatives annulling of elections in Bosnia as a key example, but gives several others amounting to aid, what, what, I, what I quoted from him before, nation building as the task of Western powers with diplomatic and security presence in the Balkans. Not the case as far as he's concerned for the Arab Spring. First of all, the perception of pre-existing wealth due to oil resources, uh, as far as he's concerned, dominates some of the calculations, as well as the fact that, you know, it's all obvious to all of us, the Western powers are coming out of, slash, to some extent, still in a recession, and this changes the calculation from the standpoint of their willingness to commit any kind of resources, whether we're talking about financial aid or uh, boots on the ground or any other kind of a presence. Uh, now, there's a, a little bit of logic also in Mythic's explanation, which suggests the situation reminiscent of Cold War alliances proxy alliances, right? Geopolitical calculations, anti-terrorism calculations, leading for, to prioritization of stability over security. The idea of a credibility deficit in the Arab Spring that was not in play at all in the context of the Balkans, whether because of alliance with Israel or because of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, et cetera, et cetera. And then this other issue, which is that to the extent that conditionality was in some sense obvious in the Balkan context, in the Arab Spring context, it really seems like uh, the Arab Spring countries can simply pick up and go to Dubai or Qatar or Iran, Russia, China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for financial or political support. So at the end of the day, you know, as, as Mietek closes his paper, it really is kind of a dark picture in terms of thinking about what kind, I mean, I don't want to reduce this to a carrot and stick, but on the other hand, it seems that there is neither carrot nor stick as far as he sees the Arab Spring countries in stark contrast to what was true a decade or more ago in the context of the Western Balkans. All right, I'm going to switch gears now. I mentioned before uh, the anniversary association that I have, which is why I do want to bring Poland to the conversation. There are about 
three dozen things that I could say, but I want to limit myself to just a handful because I think that there are a few aspects of the conversation that uh, could have been in, in, enriched yesterday if some of the uh, other Slavic countries besides the South Slavs were brought into the conversation. It breaks a lot of the clean parallels uh, between the different regions that I think we're studying in the course of this conference, but it's worth considering, uh, namely, I think, first off, that uh, Helsinki Accords should be part of the conversation, right? If we're talking about human rights and we're talking about involving the international community, it's, you know, at this point, commonplace among historians of the Cold War, historians of Central and Eastern Europe, to acknowledge that the Helsinki Accords played a role in the creation of both Poland's Committee for the Defense of Workers in 1976 and the Charter 77 group in Czechoslovakia in 1977. I thought one of, the, one, of, one of my favorite points that came up in discussion yesterday was this notion when talking about Turkey of simply trying to hold Erdogan accountable for commitments that he's already made vis-a-vis -vis the EU, right? whether secular and Islamist, et cetera, the idea of him having made certain commitments and him having to put his money where his mouth is. This is the notion that, in some sense, I just see coming straight from a parallel in Eastern Europe in the 70s, where dissidents could point to agreements signed by their respective governmental leaders and say, I didn't make it up. You signed it. Human rights. Uh, and it is a pretty straightforward calculation. Now this is, uh, I think, another way of thinking about the conditionality conversation in a way that's broader than simply the Eastern European context, right? I mean, human rights does extend to an entire regime of international norms and binding uh, uh, agreements to some extent that I think can apply across the various cases that are being studied here. Uh, that, that is really just a, sort of a, a small snippet. There are a couple other points that I wanted to highlight that are very specific to the Polish case, which I think are uh, interesting to consider uh, in, the con in the broader context that we're discussing. The first, you know, if we're talking about international actors or the international community, I think there's an easy conceptual slippage between talking about, say, heads of states of regional or global hegemons. So context of 70s and 80s Cold War Eastern Europe, that would have been obviously both the U.S. and the Soviet Union, then uh, state actors within countries that are acting in other countries. Uh, so if we're talking about aid, uh, for example, uh, also non-state actors in other countries. In the Polish context, I have a friend and colleague, Greg Domber, who was long affiliated with uh, the Cold War International History Project, who's documented beautifully how absolutely seminal the AFL-CIO was in uh, providing a support network, a part of a support network for the Solidarity Trade Union movement after the imposition of martial law in December 1981. The same goes for a variety of Western European trade union movements, right? There are non-state actors in countries other than the ones we're discussing that over the course of decades, it, when we're talking specifically about the Central and Eastern European cases, contributed to building transnational support networks that didn't ha necessarily have to intersect at all, really, with the state realm. Usually there was consultation, but not always. I mean, some of the folks that I study really are transnational Catholic activists. You want to talk about how it was that when Tadeusz Mazowiecki, the solidarity advisor, became prime minister of Poland on August 24, 1989, he actually already knew people in Europe. It was because he had met Richard von Weizsäcker, president of West Germany, in the 70s, in the early 70s, in West Germany as a fellow Catholic activist. And they connected in a way that actually provided a durable basis for correspondence. Uh, the case here I'm invoking obviously has to do somewhat with religion. It's a Polish singularity that there was a pope from 1978 onward who hailed from Poland. But nonetheless, I think uh, it doesn't take talk about the Catholic Church or Catholicism to recognize that there are transnational activist networks that function both for the purpose of stability and for the purpose of transporting resources back and forth. So, you know, if you think about Mietek's paper with Arab Spring countries looking to Dubai, looking to Qatar, et cetera, et cetera, if, if we, to the extent that Islam is considered an affinity point there, I think that's something that could actually be played in a much more substantial way for purposes of seeking conditionality from the standpoint of Western powers. I mean, this is something that worked in, almost automatically, one could say now, in Europe in the 70s and 80s, but but 
in Europe of the 70s and 80s, if we had talked to actors at the time, they would have said, are you kidding? How can you form these kinds of cross-iron curtain networks between inimically, fundamentally inimical ideological actors? The answer is that there was common ground that was found frequently on the basis of social thought that actually helped to build a support network for solidarity when it emerged, and later for a lot of these governmental actors when they came to power, Mazowiecki being the absolutely seminal example. Uh, I think I may be going on a little bit too long, but there are just two, three, three brief points uh, that I want to make uh, more. Uh, George Bush Sr. got a lot of flack in Eastern Europe for being very hands-off in the first six months of 1989. Uh, I had the privilege, actually, of having as one of my neighbors last year in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Poland, John Davis Jr., who was Reagan and Bush's ambassador during the transition in Poland, and he has a whole litany of jokes about how he could do whatever he wanted because really there was no clear directive from Washington. And moreover, he got the sense that when information was being passed up through State Department channels, it never ended up on the desk of either President Reagan or President Bush when it was coming from him. Uh, but to the extent that Bush did get involved, the first major thing he did in Polish politics, July of 1989, was say to the outgoing communist leader, General Wojciech Jaruzelski, please, please, please stand for the presidency, right? Uh, Bush has this phenomenal quote in his diary that it was ironic. Here was an American president trying to persuade a senior communist leader to run for office. And actually, this worked very well. Jaruzelski did stand for office. There was some backroom negotiation that made it possible for him to become president, and that really smoothed the transition out of Communist Party rule into what ultimately became the uh, elections for the presidency in 1990, which Lech Wałęsa won. And we think of him as the first president of free Poland, but actually it wasn't. It was the person who had put him in prison uh, a decade earlier. So this was in part Bush's intervention. It was at a dinner that Davis organized. I think it's interesting to keep in mind these sorts of cases where uh, things that seem at, the first, at first glance to be horrible blunders or like it would be better that we had done nothing at all in the first place actually ended up playing a fairly uh, constructive role in the larger formation of uh, long-term stability I in Poland. You know, on the other hand, we have Gorbachev visiting East Germany, visiting China in 1989, and he leaves destruction in his wake. You know, the Tiananmen Square massacre in some part, uh, I mean, I think he really lent a lot of uh, energy to the t protest movement in Tiananmen Square, and certainly he sped the, uh, the uh, end of Honecker's rule in East Germany. I think there are one thing that certainly is very tangible if you talk to actors from the transition in Poland, aside from the fact that the Americans basically stepped back and let them do what they wanted, and the perception thereafter is that the Americans were happy with what was going on in any case, is that there was a certain awareness of what they called the Chinese solution. After the elections on June 4th, 1989, with an overwhelming <coughs> landslide victory for solidarity, every seat that they could win in Parliament and all but one seat in the Senate, uh, sorry, in the lower house of Parliament, all but one seat in the Senate, both the communist leadership and the opposition leadership were afraid that the Soviet Union would intervene. Right. We are talking yesterday about the role of military. Obviously, in the Soviet bloc, this was different. There was a bloc hegemonic configuration of fraternal assistance when it comes to militaries. What's interesting is thinking about the fact <coughs> that the United States, and Bush specifically, saw himself, saw itself as playing a role in guaranteeing that there would not be a Soviet intervention, that there would not be a Chinese solution. This is the way they thought about it, even though obviously in China it was the Chi Chinese army cracking down on Chinese subjects. But these are the, the terms that were used to think about this. I wonder if that might be able to feed our conversation. The last thing I want to bring up is uh, some of Mazowiecki's policy, which was very much informed by this notion of conditionality. Poland wanted to be part of NATO, wanted to be part of the EU. Mostly it was an anti-Russian impulse, uh, a security concern first and foremost. But there were a lot of other elements packaged into it, which is why Mazowiecki, a lifelong third-way Catholic social activist, overnight basically turned into one of Europe's leading free market activists. Right? He famously told Jeff Sachs, I want my Echat. 
when they were setting up uh, the design for the free market transition in Poland. And that also translated into transitional justice. I think it's curious that in the Polish case, we see that conditionality helps to push transitional justice to the side. So I think related to the conversation we were having yesterday. Mazowiecki draws a thick line and says, I don't care if you were a collaborator, an informant, a functionary, a officer of the secret police, if you can contribute constructively to our progress toward membership in NATO and the European community, later the European Union, you're part of society, period. Now, 20 years later, I think to the extent that there are things wrong with Polish political culture, they're actually mostly a consequence of that decision, which is, I think, I mean, I, I say it as someone who sympathizes and w would hopefully have made the same decision in the same place. But it was a decision that was entirely almost entirely informed by conditionality. The idea that we have more important things to do than deal with past wrongs, mm -hmm. and those are economic progress, economic growth, security concerns, rejoining this place that we have always recognized. So the lesson, if there is any, from the, uh, the Polish context for what we're discussing today seems to me to be maybe uh, threefold. The first, this notion that uh, the transitional justice conversation really is related, I think, to the conditionality conversation. If we accept Mietek's contention that conditionality is completely absent from the conversation on the U.S. place in Arab Spring countries, uh, then it's very, very hard to have any kind of, for, forget control, but even the possibility of influencing paradigms of thinking about transitional justice in these countries. I think it's much more constructive if we look for maybe alternative viewpoints on what might be constituted by a membership community. The Helsinki Accords are sort of my casual way of saying that there are other ways of thinking about this. I know that, that I don't want to wade into the complex conversation on human rights from yesterday because I'd be, I'd be much more I mean, an interloper would be a kind way of thinking about it. But I do think that that's worth considering. The second thing is that uh, religion and politics in the, context, in the Polish context was pushed to the background very quickly by conditionality. I think this is something to consider uh, maybe in the context of the conversation with Turkey. Again, you know, this Helsinki point and in the broader conversation about political religion. And then the third thing is really focusing, I think, on the role of these transnational uh, social, the potential for transnational support networks that aren't limited to the realm of state action because they played such a role that is really, I think, to this day still largely undocumented in the collapse of communist regimes in most of the Central and Eastern European countries. And I think Poland is a particularly uh, remarkable case because the Catholic sphere opened a large, uh, a, a, a large door that many people passed through going in both directions. But it seems to me that this is one way possibly to suggest a more constructive and hopefully more optimistic uh, next stage to the conditionality conversation. Thank you. Thank you very um, the, that was great, uh, and there's lots more to cover there, especially on the European side, because there is lots more examples we could have focused on other than just the Polish one. Uh, Spain, Portugal also come to mind. Um, our second speaker uh, this morning is uh, Victor Alarcon, Professor of Politics at the Department of Sociology at the Autonomous University in Mexico City. Um, Victor is also a member of the Advisory Council for Legislative Research Institute uh, Belisario Dominguez Center in uh, Mexico. And most recent publication includes, and I'm translating here, so I hope I get it right, uh, Intraparty Strife in the Federal District mm -hmm. and Party System and Elections in the Federal District, 1988 to 2010. Okay. So I will give the floor to Victor. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this seminar, of, of course, especially to Ron Prusen. It, it was been a great pleasure meeting you again uh, now in, in the States. And, uh, and basically what I'm going to do is to take advantage of the great presentation made by my colleagues, my Mexican colleagues, uh, uh, Reinaldo Junuen and Mary Clara Costa, who already presented some diagnosis about the uh, political and the human rights uh, situation. So I will go rather uh, go uh, into the uh, 
economic aspects. Uh, despite the fact that the, the paper also discusses political and human rights uh, uh, issues, I prefer to go into the most specific uh, topic on economics in order to get advantage of the supplementary uh, presentation that they made yesterday. So uh, basically what I'm going to do is uh, uh, So w what I'm going to do is uh, to take, uh, you know, uh, first notice on the literature concerning uh, about uh, international political economy in terms of discussing what is the role played by the conditionality and external uh, uh, influences over transitions. And uh, specifically, uh, uh, the literature says usually that uh, countries uh, having uh, strong com commodities and they uh, they can uh, uh, develop a national power uh, interest. So in in this case, Mexico was capable to develop uh, all uh, alongside the uh, 20th cen uh, century in Mexico. Uh, Mexico was capable to de uh, to de to define uh, foreign policy by its own uh, because of the oil industry because uh, uh, as it happens now with Venezuela, for instance, they could develop also an interest, an active interest, an, an active political uh, interest in order to uh, prevent uh, external pressures or uh, interventions uh, to uh, their own uh, political system. Uh, Post-revolutionary Mexico was then uh, capable that uh, to, to develop this situation because also was uh, uh, supported by an institutional and coherent elite, endorsed also by p different political factions within the same political party, no elections in the presidency, uh, and also uh, that situation produced alternation and good opportunities, but following always the uh, internal rules, uh, especially those adopted around the official party. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, revol uh, the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Uh, secondly, uh, there was a creation of populist clientels and cooperative linkages to union workers, peasants, and more particularly to national entrepreneurs. Uh, in the third place, we could find the presence of diversified sectors in industry and services, allowing to create a middle class and share mental model uh, in order to support to the regime's ideology and political program, and both expressed in electoral terms that uh, always gave the idea that we were talking a kind of a, an exceptional regime, another kind of democracy. The regime was always talking that uh, pre prior to transition that Mexico was another kind of democracy, so not uh, always well understood from from the outside. No. Uh, in, in some other issues that we could find is uh, selective use of violence and repression that it was mentioned bef uh, yesterday. Uh, if regime opponents were not receptive to nego negotiate, the presence of a control and formal semi-competitive party system but extremely unfair and without accession to media or financial resources. And uh, as I mentioned before, the development of an active di diplomacy and economic cooperation in international affairs and multilateral organization, uh, which render into international prestige and recognition before uh, Western democracy despite the authoritarian nature of the state. This is important to, to be pointed out because Mexico has uh, had uh, uh, an interesting uh, participation in uh, uh, UN, uh, uh, um, in United nations organizations there had been part of the security council and f and f uh, they got the uh, the entrance for instance for uh, organizations such as the uh, GATT in, uh, in 1986 and more specifically to the OECD in 1994 so it means that Mexico got a uh, significant uh, grade of recognition about his policy uh, their its policies and and it's something that uh, we should uh, keep in uh, in addition, uh, what then uh, can explain the uh, Mexican uh, pathway to democracy? The Mexican regime uh, was not, uh, didn't have the ability to continue with its industrial model. I, it was a, a, a very consensual and internal uh, significant model uh, supported by national entrepreneurship. Uh, but this consensus uh, uh, broke up in the, in the 1970s. 
uh, and and that why that's why uh, Mexico didn't can continue didn't continue with the, the exploitation of uh, other. Uh, possible resources, and they uh, sustain uh, its development only based on oil revenues in order to uh, <coughs> uh, sustain the, the, the bureaucracy. So, and at the same time, it happened to be that Mexico began with uh, hit uh, with a rampant uh, uh, series of uh, corruptive uh, actions, and also it, uh, it began the ascent of the organized crime. At the same time, you know, the external uh, endowment uh, began to be a, 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 a serious problem since the 1970s, but especially from uh, the uh, uh, 1982 crisis. From that point onwards, you know, the main problem that Mexico was uh, obliged and it was uh, impelled to, to negotiate to adopt political reforms and it, uh, it began uh, uh, as uh, an era of conditionality uh, uh, linked to the uh, external recommendations to adjust its economy and its political system, uh, either with the IMF, with the World Bank, and sp more specifically with the American government. Uh, it's something that many Mexicans we don't like to discuss uh, openly, that if there was or not uh, a, 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 a direct intervention of the American government, but I think that is the right time to, to put uh, this situation on the floor. And in, uh, in, in the other, in the opposite side, this is uh, possible to 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 main, it, it, it is possible to mention it because Mexico, uh, until that time, was developing an active diplomacy in Central America. It was uh, much more prone because of the president uh, at that time, uh, Jose Lopez Portillo, was extremely. Uh, 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 sympathetic with the uh, uh, leftist uprisings in Central America at that time. And, uh, and, and in this case, the economic crisis decided to, uh, to generate a, a shift in Mexican economic policies. Uh, so the entrance of the technocrats and the neoliberal uh, you know, uh, elite in, in Mexican uh, government uh, despite the fact that it was the same pre, uh, decided to uh, some uh, substantial uh, issues and also decided that uh, some other uh, people uh, the, uh, had to leave the party and they created the uh, 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 Democratic Revolutionary Party. So it's, uh, it, it's really important to, to realize that because also it's linked to the electoral fraud that it happened in uh, 1988. So it's an uh, it's important uh, uh, period of time to be considered. And at the same time, th this neoliberal turn, as I mentioned, uh, also was uh, supplemented by the activation of uh, political opposition. More specifically, the national entrepreneurs that were uh, betrayed as, as, they, do, uh, as, they, as they thought uh, of the government, uh, now they decided to support the oppositional party, it's more specifically the PAN, the National Action Party, the right uh, wing party that has been uh, present in Mexican electoral systems since 1939. And, and, and this turn was significant because I it began to uh, uh, appear that the system uh, in politics terms became competitive and, and it was denounced uh, uh, the denounce of electoral frauds and the violation of human rights in political matters it began to be a substantial matter in international uh, er, uh, in the international arena. The denounces were presented by the PAN in several international courts or in, in international instances were a substantial issue to uh, to the topic, and uh, also because uh, Mexico was then. Uh, introduced in the process of international certifications as not being a democracy. Uh, this disturbed a lot, uh, very much, to the uh, uh, political elite, the Mexican political elite. N uh, never before Mexico was cons not considered as a democracy or was, uh, you know, uh, absent of this kind of certifications or this kind of qualification about uh, its political regime. So it was an, an, another uh, striking point uh, in, in during this period, uh, during the 1980s and the 1990s, that Mexico was becoming a normal country. You know, uh, not it was not longer a different democracy, but it was a typical authoritarian regime, or something close to that. You know? and at the same time, 
you know, the situation was, uh, the, the, the situation about renegotiating the uh, external indebtment uh, specifically and how to control inflation and, and, and this uh, situation uh, uh, around economics that produced a new generation of reforms, especially linked to, that, uh, to those uh, that uh, promoted NAFTA. NAFTA was, uh, to my concern, uh, a, a very important step in further, uh, uh, in, in order to advance uh, new political reforms in Mexico, not only the uh, uh, change in the, in the e political model. Uh, also, many people argue that uh, there was uh, several uh, uh, conditionalities in order to comply with the Washington Consensus, more specifically in the new economic crisis of 1994-95 that obliged uh, specifically to former President Ernesto Cedillo to put the revenues of the oil industry on the on the table as a <coughs> collateral, as a guarantee to uh, to uh, to pay, you know, the the uh, the uh, the debts that uh, uh, that Mexico need to 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 pay at, the, at that at that moment, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, not only uh, change uh, the political landscape because uh, of this situation, there were. Uh, institutional uh, reforms, uh, specifically in the legislative, the judiciary, and uh, finally it produced the uh, 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 final alternation of poli presidential powers uh, obtained in the electoral process of 2000. Now, if uh, I could pay more attention to the economic variables, uh, why are so important at this moment to uh, consolidate uh, uh, democracy? No, the, the Mexican democracy. Why, why it's so important to consider economic factors as being a, as, as a hardship to consolidate democracy in Mexico? First of all, because Mexico is now a country with low capacity to diversify their sources of production. You know, Mexico has, hasn't had uh, uh, substantial growth in the recent years. Uh, Mexico is basically supported by the energy sectors. It's the only uh, substantial sector that provides uh, incomes to Mexico, so uh, uh, for uh, for or, or at least for the state bureaucracy. Yeah, I I I, I don't want to mean that there is an there there is no other for sources, but ba basically state bureaucracy uh, rely relies on this uh, on this specific area, and. Uh, and in addition, Mexico has been incapable to cope with uh, the educational uh, issue. There is an impressive gap uh, related uh, to the uh, uh, incapacity that uh, we got right, right now to cope with international and uh, technological issues. And as, and as well, uh, despite the fact that external debt has been into control o over the uh, more recent years, uh, this uh, benefits in, in order to have low inflations or um, much, much, much better uh, credit in, in the international financial arena, has not uh, produced a much better uh, distribution of income and uh, had not uh, lessened uh, the uh, uh, capacity to uh, deal with inequalities uh, and poverty at local levels. So if we could see, for instance, the evolution of the Mexican indebtedness in US dollars, you, you could see that there is no uh, substantial change. No, the Mexico is uh, still uh, relying on external debt. So uh, despite the fact the, 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 the transition uh, to democracy, uh, economic hardships is uh, still a very uh, uh, important uh, factor to be considered. Later on, you could see the recent evolution of e e Mexico in that man, uh, considering the four uh, last presidents, uh, uh, you know, Carlos Salinas, Ernesto Cedillo, <laughs> Vicente Fox, and Felipe Calderón, who, as you can notice, he began to raise up the uh, external de de dead men right now. So it, this is a potential uh, risk that we have uh, right now, and, and you should keep it in, ma in mind. Later on, there is a, uh, this is a, a historical perspective of the external debt against the GDP. So you could see, more or less, the macroeconomic uh, control it's formally under a good level of, 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 of management now in the recent years. 
considering that the, the, uh, uh, the period of transition of democracy or the formal period of transition of democracy that we could find in 1970 to 2000, it was specifically a very, very complicated period, uh, and that's why uh, we, ha we could have a very good evidence that the, the importance of the external conditionality in economic uh, matters in, in that period. Later on, uh, another uh, hardships that we could have is that NAFTA has not produced m any longer uh, benefits. There is no substantial uh, growth in another international cash flows or investments of fresh capital in the, in the recent years. And also we don't have uh, m a much more uh, uh, impact of the money transfers coming from the Mexican workers you know, to the, uh, here in the States or in other countries. Uh, as used to be some some years ago, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, this uh, this uh, has been uh, a reducing uh, uh, trend in the in, in the in the in the in the recent years, and also uh, I mean uh, so 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 other uh, uh, situations are in uh, the growth on, of employment and labor dumping in salaries. As you could see, for instance, the the revenues coming from oil tourists or foreign capitals, which are the uh, three main sources of income in Mexico, you could see that uh, the, uh, formally you could have uh, uh, a general uh, development, uh, much more development in Fox years, but now uh, since uh, 209 uh, we are experiencing once again uh, 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 a situation uh, that it uh, needs to be uh, pay attention to, to this because it's a decreasing trend uh, at this moment. Also, you could see, for instance, the distribution of population in Mexico. Mexico is also unequal in uh, terms of uh, his popula uh, its population. So, uh, the population is basically concentrated in the central uh, area, uh, and also it, uh, it means that, uh, it th that means that uh, Mexico, they got a lot of problems in order to how to distribute much better uh, their incomes. Uh, as you could see, more or less, the concentration is in the bigger cities located in central Mexico. And if you could consider, instead, the opposite situation is that the distribution of GDP per, in, uh, per uh, <coughs> inhabitant is much better in those states close to the, to the United States, but uh, and, and Mexico City and probably in the, in the south uh, west of Mexico because there are uh, oil areas you know, uh, specifically the state of Campeche, which is close to, to Yucatan uh, in, in this side, uh, in the eastern side of Mexico. But as you could see, more or less, the rest of the country, uh, they have uh, difficult to, uh, to obtain substantial revenues and, and, and a good level of life. You could see, more or less, uh, the, these differences, for instance, in terms that Mexico uh, it has a gap of 94% in terms of the, uh, the, pr the, the real GDP that I if uh, we could f uh, establish a level of, uh, of one in 1960 and the one that we have now in 2010. So it means that we are a deficit of 94%. If we want to win the same amount of money uh, as it happened in to be in 1960, <coughs> we are to, uh, uh, we got to overcome a deficit of 94%. So it, that means that the minimal wage, for instance, you could see, you know, the real minimal wage in terms of having a basis of 100 in 19, uh, 1978, this is the more or less the uh, situation that we are uh, looking at the real value of minimal wage in Mexico. So you could see Mexico is not growing. Mexico has <coughs> extremely uh, uh, concerned uh, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that situation. And this is uh, something that, as, as I mentioned, ne we need to talk about in terms that uh, if maybe economics could be a new, uh, new uh, element to uh, uh, stop transition in Mexico. So that's why my final remarks basically is uh, that we are not consolidating democracy despite the fact that the, the years of alternation in Mexico has produced a very strong civil society uh, based on social networks and uh, internet and some other uh, areas, 
but uh, we we need to 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 do uh, uh, a much better uh, research about the importance of these movements movements and uh, if they are capable to call attention and to put <coughs> a different agenda in terms of how to deal with uh, these issues and uh, finally the uh, presence of organized crime and the growing networks in local political powers and the addition to the persistence of uh, authoritarian ways of culture an absence of political of, of alternation in some uh, local states is still controlled by pre, never defeated uh, 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 up to date. Uh, so uh, I think that there are uh, a serious uh, combination that could put uh, Mexico into uh, a serious uh, setback if we don't pay attention to this situation in the short term. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Victor, for that very illuminating presentation, uh, which I certainly learned an awful lot, a lot of new things about Mexico and the situation that's, that's there. Our next speaker is Stephen Larrabee, who is a distinguished, who holds a distinguished chair in European Security at the Rand Corporation. Uh, Stephen has had a very distinguished career. I will just highlight one of the two key things uh, from his illustrious CV. Uh, he has served in the National Security Council and the White House uh, during the Carter administration. On, as a specialist on uh, Soviet Eastern European affairs and East-West political <coughs> military relations. Um, he has uh, published widely, he's lectured widely at some of America's premier universities, and his, some of his more recent publications include uh, Trouble Partnership, U.S.-Turkish Relations <coughs> in an Era of Global Geopolitical Change, Turkey as a U.S. Um, security Partner, and the Rise of Political Islam in Turkey. Um, with Angel, with Engel uh, Rabassa. So I will now send, um, turn the, the microphone over to Stephen. Thank you. It's on. Yeah, okay. You're live. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk about Turkey's transformation, and I'm going to start actually with the foundation of the uh, Turkish Republic in 1923. And, go th and there are four, five factors, actually, that I'd like to look at. And first is the nature of the Kemalist Revolution, because this really set the framework for Turkey's evolution and transformation, uh, and in some ways uh, also hindered it. Uh, second, I'm going to look at the Rizal reforms in the 1980s, because while they were economic reforms, they had a very important, unexpected and unanticipated political and social repercussions, which have a lot to do with the problems uh, that Turkey has in its own modernization and transformation. Then I'm going to look at the role of the uh, military, which of course has very, played a very special role in Turkey's transformation and democratization. Then. Uh, look at the role of the EU and NATO <coughs> and as outside factors. So let me begin by talking about the, the Kemalist Revolution, because I think this is the way you have to understand and think about Turkey. Uh, Ataturk's attempt to transform Turkey into a modern Western secular state essentially represented a revolution from above. It was a state-instituted, top-down enterprise of social engineering carried out by a small military bureaucratic elite that imposed its secularist vision on a reluctant trans traditional society. That is the essence of what w went on. This, uh, and the new Kemalist elite sought a radical break with the Ottoman past and the Ottoman era and everything associated with it except a few elements of past grandeur, uh, and it discarded uh, these in favor of a new project based on westernization and secularism. And in the first decade after the founding of the Republic, the Kemalists carried out a series of reforms that severed Turkey's ties to the Islamic past and to the Islamic world more broadly. The caliphate was abolished, the Latin uh, 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 alphabet was introduced in the place of Arabic script, uh, and an effort was made to purge the Turkish language from words of, with Arabic and Persian origin. 
The elite discouraged traditional attire and secularized the educational system. All religious institutions and resources were brought under the control of the state. However, most of these reforms were limited to the urban centers, and the countryside essentially remained largely untouched. Until the 1950s, the bulk of the Turkish population remained isolated and traditional, while the urban centers were modern and secular. And in effect, what you had was two Turkeys coexisting on, in an easy harmony, an urban, modern, and secular center, and a rural, traditional, and religious periphery, with little contact, in many ways, between the two. The dominant elite was urban, modern, and secular, while the bulk of the population was rural, traditional, and pious. Religion, however, was not completely suppressed. It was simply banished from the public sector and strictly subordinated to and supervised by the state through the Directorate of Religious Affairs. In effect, religious institutions became appendages of the state, with their personnel acting as civil servants. In the countryside, however, as I mentioned, Islam continued to have strong social roots and remained largely beyond the state control despite the ban on religious orders introduced in 1925. Like its Ottoman predecessor, the Kamala state discouraged the development of autonomous groups outside the control of the state. Autonomous activity was regarded by the state as a potential threat to the ability uh, its ability to carry out its modernization effort and consolidate its political control. Dissent or opposition to the regime's nationalist ideology and modernization policies was quickly suppressed. This attempt to suppress the autonomous activity outside the control of the state not only alienated a large majority of the rural population, for whom religion was an important part of the daily life, but it also hindered the development of a civ strong civil society more generally. So these, if you, it's, I do start with the, this because I want you to see in some ways where the, many of the tensions that exist today in Turkish society, they have their roots in the way in which the, the Turkish state uh, and political system was founded. After Ataturk's death in 1938, the authoritarian tendencies of, uh, uh, continued. Ataturk's successor, Ismen Inunu, uh, sought to build a regime legitimacy on a strict interpretation of Kemalism. And you can see a lot of quite frankly, uh, similarities between the uh, personality cult of Ataturk and the personality cult of Lenin or Stalin, not comparing Ataturk in any way with uh, the type of uh, crimes that were carried out by Stalin, but I am saying that there was, an, uh, and still is, a, a cult of personality that uh, and an effort to turn that uh, cult into a kind of uh, ideology, and in fact, a, a, a almost a fundamentalist uh, ideology. The one-party rule served as a means to carry out a radical transformation of Turkish society. The majority of the population, as I mentioned, remained outside of politics and wedded to a traditional habits and lifestyles in which Islam continued to exert an important influence. So you've got these, there are these two Turkeys, one modern, uh, secular, and then another which composes the majority of the population, probably 80%, uh, which is traditional, religious, and this tension uh, has continued to exist now. Uh, and 
as you will see, to try to point out um, how and why, in some ways, the AKP, and what I'll try to do, uh, has, uh, what, what is the nature of the AKP party, that is the Justice and uh, Democracy Party, uh, Development Party, why this party was able to come to power, why has it been able to stay in power? But this, the origins of the tension in the society uh, go back to the foundations of the, the, of the Kemalist uh, state itself, as I've said. In a sense, what has occurred over the last several decades, in my view, is an attempt of this marginalized periphery traditional, pious, to find its political voice and, repre uh, and representation. Political Islam has increasingly provided that uh, voice. Now you, uh, over time, the political goals and ideology of the Islamic movement have evolved and it is jettisoned or moderated many of the key tenets of its uh, initial political agenda, particularly its hostility to westernization, in an effort to, uh, to attract a broader uh, political s support. But what, uh, what has really happened, in my view, is that with the opening up of Turkish society, with the, uh, in 1950, with the uh, introduction of competitive party politics, this gave more space to uh, all groups, political groups, and including Islamic groups. And the democratization of Turkish society and policy, politics, is a fundamental uh, reason why the Islamic uh, Islamists have uh, come to power uh, in in Turkey. Now, another factor which is important uh, is, of course, uh, as I said, the reforms undertaken by Turgut Özal, uh, prime minister in the 1980s and president thereafter, but. As prime minister, Izal in, introduced uh, economic and political reforms which accelerated the transformation of Turkish society into the Turkish state. And the, f the fact was that these were economic reforms, but these reforms weakened state control over the economy and, and created a new class of entrepreneurs and capitalists in provincial towns in Anatolia. The economic upswing created, in effect, a new a middle class, so-called Anatolian bourgeoisie, with strong roots in Islamic culture. In other words, it produced a counter-elite, in, in essence. Azal's reforms also opened up greater political space for new political groups, including the Islamists. Islamic groups gained access to important media outlets and newspaper chains, which allowed them to reach a much broader political audience. So what you have here is economic reforms, liberalization, which liberalizes the economy, but at the same time has very important impact on uh, society opening up society and opening up uh, po the political system indirectly, not, not something that was anticipated or expected. Uh, television in particular provided an important means of propagating the Islamic, Islamicist uh, message. And when I first began going to Turkey in the 1960s, there were three television channels, all of them state controlled. Now anybody that's been to Turkey knows that there are hundreds of them. None of them, I uh, won't say none of them, but 
the 99 percent of them not controlled by the by the state. Demographic changes in occurred also because of the liberalization of the economy also had an impact. The industrial and modernization policies pursued by successive Turkish governments led to a large-scale influx of the rural population into the cities. So again, another indirect uh, consequence that is all had not thought about at all. But these rural migrants then came into the cities with their traditional beliefs, habits, and customs. Uprooted and alienated, many of them lived in makeshift shanty towns on the outskirts of the large cities and were not integrated into urban culture. And anybody who's been to Turkey and seen these in, in the major cities. This represented an important pool of potential voters for Islamic parties opposed to westernization and the forces of globalization. So you had in the, this social disruption because of the Azal reform, reforms, which we created, uh, again, a kind of uh, growing underclass which moved into the cities and which was uh, a potential pool for uh, voters for uh, Islamic parties. But the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, which is the one now in power, uh, headed by Rizal, uh, by Erdogan, would not have been able to win an election if it were simply a religious party. It has a strong base in the uh, pious uh, and religious uh, traditional elements of, that have come into, moved into the cities. But the fact of the matter is that in the last election, it got 49.9% of the, the popular vote. It cannot and could not get that based simply on religious uh, affinity and so forth. You might be able to get 15% of the vote on that. But what the AKP has done is turn itself into a kind of catch-all party. And it has started with its base of 15% of uh, pious religious uh, followers. But then it has mo moved in and attracted uh, support from the liberal intelligentsia, uh, westernized. Uh, also part of the uh, business community because of the AKP's uh, initial uh, strong support for EU membership, and I'll come back to this. Uh, and because it has, with all its faults and weaknesses, has still uh, taken the most liberal and open position on uh, the role of the Kurds and on Kurdish rights of any party. So they got a strong vote from the Kurds, strong vote from the liberal intelligentsia, uh, because it had a reform uh, agenda, and a strong in, in inroads into the business class. And finally, then, its base. And that, has, that explains why it has been able to be as successful as it's been able to, able to be because it has not relied on its traditional base, but re reached out. The CHP, the Republican People's Party, which is the party of Ataturk, has, for the last 40 or 50 years, got no more than 22, 23 to 26% of the popular, popular vote. And it has stayed that way, uh, and it has made practically no effort to modernize or to reach out. It represents a sec the secularist part of the society. Again, 20 or 25 percent. The difference was that in under a one-party system, 
uh, that 20 or 25 percent could rule and had strong support in major institutions, education, judiciary, military, foreign policy elite. Uh, but that, as I said, began to change in the 1950s when the, uh, the system opened up. Now, historically, we talk a little bit about the role of the military. The military has been a driving force behind Turkey's modernization. Uh, it sees itself uh, as the guardian of Turkey's constitutional order, particularly secularism, and the embodiment of Turkey's uh, Ataturk uh, legacy. On four occasions since the end of World War II, the military has intervened and ousted democratically elected civilian governments when it felt there was a so-called threat to, the, to Turkey's uh, constitutional order. Now, the important point about Turkish military to right realize is that they have not only a external uh, mission, but an internal mission. And that is, uh, again, uh, in the Constitution that they are responsible for defending the country against external but also internal threats. And that, of course, is something that uh, is not compatible uh, with most uh, democratic uh, systems, that, uh, there is a, that they would have a t uh, an internal uh, role as well. Okay, uh, let me go quickly then. So each time it's returned to the barracks, but there have been a number of uh, laws and, uh, and regulations that have uh, essentially weakened the c control of the mil uh, military. Under the reform package introduced by the AKP in July 2000. And three, the NS, the National Security Council, was reduced to a truly advisory uh, body. And uh, the requirements that the NSC secretary be a military officer were abolished, and the number of civilian members in the NSC were uh, increased. These changes have reduced the influence of the military in Turkish politics and strengthened civilian control over the military. Now, I have to realize I have to uh, speed up. Let me just say a, a word then about uh, the external factors, particularly the question of the EU uh, impact on Turkey's transformation. The EU has probably been the most important external influence on Turkey's transformation, uh, particularly the democratization process. The desire for membership has forced Turkey to make internal reforms that otherwise might not have made or certainly would not have made as quickly as it did. Difference between the OSCE, let's say, and the EU, however, is that Turkey is essentially applied to uh, join a club. And the club has certain regulations. Uh, there was no, there's been no signing of any agreement, uh, unlike uh, what was said before. before the, the, the difference, but they have signed up to abide by conditions the, of the club. And this uh, has posed uh, some uh, problems for, uh, for Turkey, and there has been uh, the process of reform, which was quite strong when the AKP came to power in the Justice and Development Party in uh, November, November of 2002. Uh, after 2005, the pressure for reform 
uh, and uh, the amount of attention that was given to the type of reforms uh, with, the, uh, with the EU slowed down. And there were several reasons for this. One had to do with changes in Europe itself, growing doubts whether Turkey was a quote-unquote European country. That had, that had a lot to do with the fact that it is an uh, overwhelmingly Muslim country. There was a growing debate in Europe about the wisdom of further EU enlargement. So these are internal factors to the EU, but they had an impact on Turkish attitudes. There were differences over Cyprus. And, and more recently, Turkey's strong economic performance and the European EU uh, crisis Euro crisis have raised growing doubts in Turkey itself whether EU membership is really worth uh, the hassle. Lastly, let me say just briefly a briefly. word about uh, NATO. Uh, NATO has had uh, an important impact on Turkey's political development as well, but this has been much more indirect uh, than direct. The 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 real pressure has come uh, from the EU. And Luke, why don't I stop there? Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, our, uh, our next paper, moving swiftly along, uh, is, is jointly presented by uh, Brendan King and uh, Ronald Poussin. Uh, Ronald is former chair of the History Department at the University of Toronto, and he's a PhD student, uh, uh, Brendan King, who is soon to complete his PhD on a dissertation that examines U.S.-Iraqi relations during the Eisenhower presidency. So I'll pass the floor over to both of you. Thank you. Well, I was uh, interested in, in the fact that uh, uh, Piotr did a, uh, uh, a, a sort of duet performance with Mitek, who is not here. Uh, Brandon and I <laughs> are going to do our duet in, in person, at least in, uh, in, in this case. And we'd, we'd like to, uh, uh, to just add something a little bit different to the, to the conversation, in particular about uh, external pressures and interventions, by suggesting uh, our, I think, enthusiasm about the ways in, in which the discussions of Eastern Europe and Turkey and Mexico and Brazil uh, provide wonderful uh, uh, opportunities for comparative analysis. But we'd also like to suggest as historians uh, that uh, some deeper uh, historical analysis would also have real value. And we're just going to pick one uh, example among many uh, possibilities uh, and obviously uh, look at what was a period of volatile transition in uh, the Middle East and North Africa in the 1950s and try to suggest some of the ways in which um, that experience of, uh, of a deeper historical uh, character um, also offers some, some interesting uh, opportunities for comparative discussion. Thank you. Well, let me just uh, briefly sort of set the stage for our, our two case studies by considering the sort of larger international context of the 1950s uh, in Egypt and Iraq and the broader Middle East, of course. Uh, in this period, the Middle East and North Africa, you see the ongoing process of decolonization, the gradual decline of the power of the traditional European powers in the Middle East, the British, the French. And these developments were particularly concerning and difficult for American officials because the Americans traditionally relied on the British partners uh, in the region for their military assets, for London's access to the oil reserves of the region, among other reasons. Moreover, more problematic for American officials was the fact that the 1950s were also marked by the rise of these anti-colonial, anti-Western nationalisms throughout the Middle East and throughout North Africa. You see some of them uh, listed here on our PowerPoint and our longer present in our longer paper. We talk about some of these in more depth, but of course you have Mohammed Mossadegh's uh, challenge to Western oil interests in Iran. You have Jordanian nationalists derailing London's attempt to join Jordan to the, the Baghdad Pact. You have, of course, the Suez Crisis. For our purposes, let me just sort of keep my comments brief about Egypt and Iraq. Uh, before July 1958 in Iraq, of course, you have Iraqi nationalists who were fighting against the pro-Western monarchy, the pro-Western government in Baghdad. And we're very pleased to see the demise of that government in July 1958 with the revolution. In Cairo as well, you have nationalist sentiment that was really characterized, epitomized by the emergence of Gamal Abdel Nasser. 
And Nasser very quickly throughout the 1950s became the figurehead for an entire generation of pan-Arab nationalists who were inspired by his calls for an offensive against Western domination of the region. <laughs> There's a great deal that has been written, obviously, about the Middle East and North Africa in the 1950s, uh, some wonderful uh, narrative and analytical work that has appeared in recent years. And, uh, but very much with, uh, with just a few minutes to share some preliminary thoughts with you. Brandon and I want to focus on, I guess, three areas where we think uh, the connections with more recent so-called Arab Spring developments would seem to warrant focused attention in a comparative analysis exercise that may go forward from here. On one hand, the varied concerns of external actors or the nature of the objectives they would have set for themselves in formulating policies and actions. Secondly, the varied nature of responses, pressures, interventions generated by those concerns and objectives. And thirdly, the nature, the varied nature of the results generated in turn by the range of responses and pressures and interventions. And before going into more depth in our two case studies, we also want to uh, offer a cautionary note of sorts. And that is that, of course, our presentations and our paper takes as its primary focus the United States and its policies in the 1950s in these two case studies. But we do so, of course, mindful of the broader international complexity uh, in these two case studies, the regional complexity, the diversity of actors involved in these two case studies. You have, of course, external actors like the British and the Soviets who are essential, really, to shaping how Americans formulated strategies for the Middle East in the 1950s. Of course, the US and the British spar uh, quite famously over the Suez Crisis in 1956. London and Washington also disagree about how to engage with the new revolutionary regime that emerges in Baghdad after July 1958. American officials are also, of course, worried about a wider Soviet offensive in the Middle East, particularly in Egypt and Iraq, which also, again, sort of shapes the way that American officials approach the Middle East. You have regional actors as well, like the Saudis, the Turks, the Israelis, that are also impacting the way that American officials are viewing developments in Egypt and Iraq. Saudi Arabia and Turkey, of course, were both close allies of the United States in this period, but Sa the Saudis and the Turks also found themselves on the opposite sides of the Arab Cold War that's going on in the 1950s between Egypt and Iraq. Israel, of course, is one of the main participants in the attack on Nasser at Suez. So all of this, again, is to simply hint at the sheer complexity of the factors, the participants involved in both the Egyptian and the Iraqi case studies. If I were going to turn then to talking about as one example of this, the nature of American responses as an external actor to the Suez uh, crisis situation in 1956, to zero in initially on the question of the nature of U.S. concerns, complexity, as Brandon was just saying, is very much a part of the story. There is a traditional theme uh, in much of the literature on the Suez Crisis that talks about the uh, nature of American concern over uh, Soviet uh, uh, opportunities in the Middle East opened by British and French and Israeli uh, intervention, military action at that particular point. And I've included uh, on this PowerPoint slide just one example of uh, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. Uh, talking about uh, exactly this issue to the National Security Council. Uh, but it is also important, and here's where the complexity comes in, to recognize that at least behind closed doors, not necessarily in public discussions, there was great sensitivity to what was, uh, was almost surely an even greater concern, and that was the, uh, the existence of a rising tide of what was freely described as Arab nationalism, as pan-Arabism uh, in Washington in these years, and the American concern for, uh, for dealing with, uh, with uh, pan-Arabism pan in a way that would not as Dulles again puts it in a National Security Council comment, in order to not alienate the Arabs, because to do so, as Dulles would have put it, did put it, would result in cutting off Arabian oil. This in turn would greatly weaken Europe economically and bring NATO to a standstill. All of the gains of the Marshall Plan would be canceled, as Dulles put it. The responses based on this combination of concerns, kind of traditional Cold War mentality, but real, I think, sophisticated sensitivity, more than was usually credited to American policy in this period, uh, sensitivity to Arab nationalism and local regional sentiments, 
uh, a variety of uh, American responses, very clearly leading to uh, the break with the British and the French and the Israelis uh, over their military operations at that point. So it's actually an older theme, well predates uh, the Suez uh, crisis, and I've included again in the PowerPoint slide, an example of Dulles' uh, quite early comments. His first trip to London after uh, taking over as Secretary of State in 1953, uh, in, in which he is uh, freely frank uh, with uh, British leaders about American concern about their Victorian or, as he puts it, Western superiority cult approaches in which the uh, approach seemed to be that the way to deal with such peoples as the Arabs, increasingly nationalistic and independent-minded, the way to deal with such peoples was to be stern and firm with them and to deliver a well-placed kick uh, when they made difficulties. Uh, this was not the way Washington wanted to proceed. Washington felt that such an attitude could not succeed and would create anti-Western feelings in the Middle East, which would affect us all, meaning the United States, as well as Great Britain and France. By 1956, the same message consistently delivered uh, to the British ambassador, the use of force might set East against West to a, a degree which has never before existed. There would not be enough troops to put out all the fires which might start once hostilities in Egypt began. Far better, uh, Dulles, Eisenhower, and other senior policymakers put it, to find various forms of accommodation, with Nasser in particular, uh, accommodation with the powerful nationalist forces at work in the post-colonial Middle East. This, as Dulles put it, might allow the great powers to, quote, guide the revolutionary and nationalistic pressures throughout the area into orderly channels, not antagonistic towards the West. I was tempted to go with only this slide uh, with respect to the results of U.S. thinking and policymaking in 1956, because in fact the results were not remotely uh, along the lines that Americans were hoping for at this point. I did go uh, one step further, uh, however, uh, just to underline what may uh, be obvious to many of you uh, in any event, and that is that the United States simply did not get uh, what it sought uh, in, this, uh, in this particular period of time. Uh, it did manage to restrain Great Britain and France and Israel, but in terms of its ability to manage, to <laughs> channel uh, Arab nationalism, uh, Nasserism, and, and the like, no. Uh, it was uh, a quite dismal failure and led to an extended uh, period of uh, frustration, I think, for uh, American policymakers. And an important observation to keep in mind in this respect is that that failure to achieve the desired results that were evident in the lead up to or in the earlier weeks of the Suez Crisis leads to a period of real frustration and, frankly, anger on the part of American policymakers. And you get a very different side of American policy emerging as a result uh, in 1956 and 1957, uh, in which the uh, American assumption uh, is that, in fact, what the United States needs to do is become tougher. The good cop that one might uh, notice in the fall and winter of 1956 becomes a bad cop uh, in 1957 and, uh, and after. Uh, in which, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm jumping ahead uh, there, in which the United States uh, quickly decides that, in fact, uh, uh, as Eisenhower puts it, uh, there is an evil influence, his words, uh, coming from Cairo that the United States has to take uh, stern measures to deal with. Uh, and uh, although it continues to believe, uh, and is very explicit about this, that uh, the United States does not need to go the route uh, of Great Britain and France, that it can behave in, as it puts it, more subtle uh, fashion. Uh, as Eisenhower puts it to the, uh, to the British uh, ambassador again, uh, the United States did not feel that one could change foreign governments by direct action. To, to try to do so usually had the opposite uh, effect. Instead, and these are now Dulles's words, political and economic pressures against Nasser would work, just as they had indeed against Great Britain and France in order to force them to pull back from their uh, Suez operations. There are, Dulles says, certain policies which will lead the Egyptian people to feel that Nasser is not a very good leader. Uh, 
that doesn't work either uh, in this uh, particular context. But you do have that shift of style uh, that takes place uh, in, uh, in 1957 and after. Well, with an eye on the clock, I will uh, focus my brief remarks on the American intervention in Iraq following the July 1958 Iraqi Revolution. As I said, the pro-Western regime in Baghdad is overthrown in July 1958. Uh, using our, again, our framework for the, our presentation, speaking of the concerns and the objectives of American officials, the concerns and objectives of American officials in Iraq after July 1958 are fairly easy to discern. In this period, the new Iraqi leader, Abdel Karim Qasim, relied heavily uh, on the local Iraqi Communist Party for political support. And not surprisingly, American officials grew concerned that Iraq was moving toward the brink of a possible communist takeover in Baghdad. And you see, uh, illuminating some of these concerns, the remarks from Treasury Secretary Robert Anderson referencing the French defeat uh, at, in Indochina in 1954. And he says, in reference to Iraq, we do not want another Dien Bien Phu. So America's anxieties or concerns about what's going on in Baghdad actually leads them to a rather unexpected ally, Gamal Abdel Nasser. And with Nasser's help, American officials actually begin an indirect covert form of intervention against Qasem's regime in late 1958 through to early 1960. And the objective of their campaign was also reasonably simple, if rather elusive. That was the removal of Qasem, the establishment of an anti-communist stable regime in Baghdad, one that would lean in pro-American directions. So let me in turn then offer some specifics about some of the pressures, the interventions that are generated by these concerns. And the Americans design a specific interventionist strategy to try and remedy what they saw as the political crisis ongoing in Baghdad at this time. And Washington's intervention was marked by several flashpoints in which American officials actually acquired advanced warnings of coup attempts against Qasem's regime, of attempts by Nasser to try and overthrow Qasem's government. And in our longer paper, I outlined several of these uh, different episodes. The third one is, I think, worth noting in some detail, which comes in October 1959. And in this third episode, intelligence reports that were provided to President Eisenhower on the 1st of October 1959 indicated that a new coup to start with the assassination of Qasem is scheduled within a week. And true to those predictions, the eventual plot to kill Qasem unfolded exactly one week later. Uh, when gunmen from the Ba'ath Party in Iraq ambushed the prime minister while he was in his car. Uh, Qasem actually survives this attempt on his life, uh, and the attempt is also quite infamous now because it includes a young Saddam Hussein as one of the, the Ba'athist plotters. So in the, for the third time in just one calendar year, the Eisenhower administration kept deliberately silent about reliable advance warnings that they had of an impending campaign to oust Qasem from power. U.S. officials also were vigorously debating strategies that they themselves could pursue in conjunction in parallel with Nasser's plots. And as part of this policy, an interde interdepartmental agency was created in April 1959, known as the Special Committee on Iraq, or the SCOI. The committee's task was, as President Eisenhower determined, to see what the United States, either alone or in concert with others, can do to avoid a communist takeover in Iraq. And in the sessions of this committee, the SCOI, you have representatives from the CIA, of course, representatives from the Pentagon, and they vigorously go on the offensive, trying to convince the State Department officials to authorize more expansive, intensive joint planning with Nasser to try and overthrow Qasem's regime. And one uh, choice quote from this, this period is from John Irwin, Assistant Secretary of Defense, who says in April 1959 to his State Department colleagues that we could help out Nasser if it came to another uprising. Now, through the fall and the winter of 1959, the apparent communist threat in Iraq continues to rise. And in late September, just on the eve of that Ba'athist assassination attempt, the CIA ominously noted that we have done all we can operationally to get ready. There is a small stockpile in the area. We could support elements in Jordan and the UAR to help Iraqis filter back to Iraq. The Pentagon expanded on some of these comments in early 1960. They said that they needed better intelligence from U.S. agencies in Baghdad in order to appraise the various Iraqi groups and our chances of success in working through them. American officials were also using coded language, which I think, in retrospect, strongly suggests possible American participation in various assassination plots against Qasem. 
the most revealing of these uh, is provided on our PowerPoint from Robert Knight of the Pentagon in late December 1959, where he said that he was worried about pushing the button. The basic thing that concerned him was attempting to do something for the sake of doing something. Let me just wrap up my brief remarks then by considering the actual results of the American subversive intervention in Baghdad. It is certainly true that a reasonably stable anti-communist regime does emerge in Baghdad by early to mid-1960, but it's important to note that this result was not the product of Cairo or Washington's subversive efforts at all. Instead, it was Prime Minister Qasem who was responsible for taking a series of strong measures in early 1960 against the communists. And this, of course, was a man whom the Americans had now targeted for removal, who saw as a barrier to stability in Iraq. So it was, again, the Iraqis themselves rather than the Americans who helped reestablish this political equilibrium in Baghdad in March 1960. With an eye uh, to, to the clock and trying to, uh, trying to be as, br as brief as possible, just three observations in conclusion based on uh, some of the uh, events and developments, responses, actions, et cetera, that we've been uh, trying to identify uh, in the Suez crisis case and in the uh, late 1950s Iraqi uh, case. Um, first, that um, the experiences of the United States and indeed other powerful actors uh, seeking to influence uh, events and developments in the Middle East and North Africa during the volatile 1950s. Uh, what we see over and over again uh, is uh, incredible complexity. Uh, that is, as we would put it, quite literally mind-boggling at times in its challenges for intelligence analysts and policymakers who sometimes recognize the limits of their uh, information and intelligence, but uh, sometimes didn't, uh, but were consistently challenged uh, by exactly this kind of, of complexity, uh, volatility, et cetera. Uh, second uh, brief ob observation. Uh, the complexities of the arena, again, the cast of actors who are involved in our case studies also contributes to another important characteristic of, uh, characteristic of this period, which is the limited control capabilities of external actors like the United States. And in spite of their notional power, their capabilities, and their sometimes extreme efforts, the United States was not able to achieve the results that they were seeking in either case. And this holds true as well, I think, for the United States in the events of the Arab Spring. I think it's fair to suggest that events in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria, and we might now add Turkey, have not unfolded the ways that American policymakers would have liked or would have preferred. And thirdly, finally, uh, although external actors like the United States actually showed awareness of the challenges of complexity in the Middle East of the 1950s and were unavoidably made conscious of the limits of their control capabilities, this did not stop policymakers from regularly jumping the traces that intellect and pragmatism might have put in place. Eisenhower and Dulles were shrewd and articulate in their calculation of the potential for disastrous results in British, French, Israeli actions in 1956. Three years later even, Dulles remained insightful in trying to navigate the storms that followed the Iraqi coup this was the Secretary of State, for example, in 1958, uh, and indeed in early 1959, who would tell the National Security Council, quote, it was essential to keep our hands off of Iraq because Washington was not sufficiently sophisticated to mix into this complicated situation as yet. Dulles's at yet is symbolic and important, however signaling a kind of trapdoor that often existed in policymaking pragmatism for the United States. Witness the shift that uh, came with a good cop to bad cop style with Nasser immediately after the Suez crisis. Witness the ever-expanding plans for covert operations in Iraq in 1958 and 59. U.S. caution was routinely overpowered by variations and permutations of other drivers of policy. Sometimes it could be intensified estimations of the dangers being considered and confronted. Sometimes it was optimism fueled by a sense of mission or responsibility. 
Sometimes feelings of entitlement befitting a great power. Sometimes all of these and yet other impulses. The point is, whatever the combinations, a sense of risk could be dangerously uh, diminished as a result. So too, I think we can now appreciate with the Arab Spring. With an eye to the recent past, consider the mission creep, a pattern evident as the approach to Libya moved substantially beyond an original United Nations mandate, uh, which not coincidentally and ironically uh, involved a 1950s-like U.S. entanglement with once imperial powers, Great Britain and France. And with an eye to the future, consider the state of play regarding external intervention in Syria right now and in the near future. Will Obama be able to keep front and center his Eisenhower Dulles-like concern for caution and his sensitivity to the limits of U.S. power? For the moment, this seems to be the case. But Eisenhower and Dulles went off in more aggressive and dangerous directions in spite of their finely tuned antennae. And Obama has not always been the cool Mr. Spock once sketched by Maureen Dowd. As in the 1950s, there is ample reason to worry about the behavior of external actors like the United States in the Arab Spring saga. Thank you. Thank you both very much for that choreographed double act. Um, <laughs> finally, uh, our, uh, our commentator for all these papers is no easy task. He's Maria Ottaway, a colleague of ours here at the Wilson Center and senior scholar who has worked for years on, on issues relating to Africa, the Balkans, and the Middle East. So I'll pass the floor over to uh, you. Thank you very much. Since we are truly out of time at this point, I will not comment on the papers, uh, you know, one by one as I had planned. I'm going to try some general conclusions on the issue of external influences on the Arab transitions, and above all, what we can we expect of those external uh, influences to be. Let me start with an observation that although this is a panel on external influences, we have talked a lot more about domestic factors than we have talked about external influences. And this is not meant as a criticism. It's meant as this is the way it is. Most of these transitions really owe very little to external factors. In fact, the only author who clearly uh, stated essentially the importance of, uh, of external factor uh, is the one who is not here who discussed, <laughs> who discussed the case of Albania. And, uh, and he, uh, you know, bringing the in this very important issue of leverage that, uh, and the fact that the cases where there is an important influence of external actors is where these external actors have truly leverage. Now, I would argue to go perhaps a little bit beyond there and to say it's, it's not just a question of leverage in the sense of having uh, something to offer to these countries that they want, but it's also a question of whether or not you have the determination to use this leverage, because I think it's, it's really a combination of the two. And I would argue that the Albanian case, like all the, the, the cases in the Balkans, really belong to a different era, in not only of US foreign policy, but I would say also of the attitude of European countries. And in, the, in that sense, I'd like to remind you all about <coughs> the literature on nation building that was coming out in the 1990s, still on the eve of the uh, Iraqi invasion, uh, of the US invasion of Iraq, which was simply breathtaking in terms of the conceit of external actors. We were publishing manuals on how to reconstruct the country. There are some <coughs> studies that are really extraordinary in that sense, in terms, you know, it's from soup to nuts. Everything that has to be done, and here are volumes that go on for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, hundreds of pages, 
and we have seen the outcome of some of those attempts and then in totally different situ in a situation where we did not have the leverage and that was we had the determination but not the leverage and that was co of course was Iraq and Afghanistan so it essentially we are approaching these uh, we are approaching these transitions in situations in which we have neither the leverage nor the determination why don't we have the leverage i would argue uh, uh, the, uh, let me bring this. One very important reason is there are other actors that are involved in this transition, in these transitions, that in many ways are more influential than we have. We all know that uh, that the Gulf countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and Qatar, are putting a lot of money into uh, these transitions. And here I'm just talking about uh, the official money. We, there are billions of dollars going to the central banks of countries in tran transition and so on. We also think that there are billions of dollars, perhaps not billions, but large amounts going to specific organizations in these countries. Everybody knows that the Qataris are uh, are funding the Muslim Brothers and the uh, uh, and the, uh, the the Saudis are. Uh, uh, are not, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is that nobody knows anything about uh, this funding. I have tried to I have tried to find some data. I have talked to anybody I can think of that might have done the research and found some data. There is absolutely no data except the statements that you find in the newspapers that these countries are funding these people. But if you just limit yourself to the official data, what is clear is that the assets at this point in the, that the uh, uh, the leverage in these transitions is really not coming from the West, but it is coming from uh, these countries. Uh, and there is a very interesting issue that I'm trying to pursue at this point is that is how is that uh, really limiting the, the capacity not only of countries like the United States and uh, the, the countries of the European Union to have an impact on the transition, but also how is it affecting the influence of the IMF and the World Bank that have, for example, as you pointed out in the case of Mexico, had a very important role in influencing some of what it goes on. So it's not only that our assets the, uh, are small because neither Europe nor the United States are capable, or I would say willing, because the money is still there, but it's a question of willingness to make, uh, to make money available to uh, these countries in transitions, but we are being competed by countries that have much deeper pockets in terms of just instant liquidity that uh, the sale of oil and gas, uh, the oil and gas provides. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, finally, the other uh, factor which is really limiting the uh, capacity of external actors to influence, and really goes back to this last dis uh, discussion, the stunning complexity of, the, of these situations. The Middle East has not become any simpler since the days of John Foster <laughs> Dulles. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, still, they are still in, it's not only the stunning complexity of the situation itself, it's the extremely mixed motives of the, uh, of the Western countries towards uh, this. That I would argue that we very frankly do not know what we want in these countries. Yes, we want democracy, but we want <laughs> democracy when it is a slow process of reform from the top. I think the Moroccan model is what the West really means when we say we want democracy. We want these regimes to become a bit more uh, nicer in the way that they do things, if I can use that term a bit simplistically. We want uh, them to become more presentable. We, yeah, we do, we, do want, we do want to become, uh, uh, that I cannot resist the temptation, a, um, somebody, a, a Yugoslav, a Croatian, I should say, not Yugoslav, a Croatian observer a long time ago told, uh, told me the United States want these countries to be showered and deodorized. But so essentially, we, 
yes, we do reform, but we don't want the reform to be radical. Yes, we think elections are part of the reform. We don't like the results. We are trying to keep a brave face contrary to what the U.S. did in 2006 in the case of the victory of Hamas in Palestine. We are putting a brave face on a situation we don't like at all. We are playing along, but we are not convinced about what, uh, they are not what we are doing. So essentially, there is this very mixed, uh, not only a complex situation on one side, but complex motives on the other. And I would argue that also those motives are beginning to change, because I don't think we see the full impact yet, and I don't think we have thought through the issues, but I think the calculus of the United States about the importance of this area is beginning to change, it's bound to change. There is one fixed element which is not about to change, which is uh, the state of Israel. But there is another of the two pillars on which uh, the, uh, uh, on which, uh, the uh, uh, US policy was based, access to energy, which is likely to start uh, changing very rapidly. I mean, the idea that the United States is soon to be an exporter of gas, uh, the, 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 you know, the, uh, we have been talking for years about uh, freeing the United States from dependence on the Middle East for oil and gas, and now we don't know what to do with the, uh, <laughs> the fact that it is beginning to happen. So we have both the complexity and we have, uh, uh, we have these very mixed motives in our own approach, and I would argue that in reality, I as a result, the impact is on this transition is really minimal. One last point, that does not mean that what the U.S. does or not does not to do towards uh, these countries, it's unimportant. I think the policy choices are as important as ever, but they are not choices that they are important not because what the U.S. or Europe do is going to change uh, the course of, this of history in this country. Not, it's not going to determine the outcome of the transitions. It, it's important because it determines how the US and Europe position themselves towards uh, these new regimes that are emerging in the area. And I'll stop here because I, I, sorry, because there were a lot of very interesting points in all the papers, but given the time, I really cannot take. Thanks, Marina, and that was predictably insightful as always. Um, I will use the chair's prerogative to take a couple of questions from the floor. We did start two about 10 minutes late, so if you don't mind holding off your lunch, I will take one round of questions. Yep. So if you can state your name and affiliation uh, before your question. Thank you. There's a microphone just behind you. Um, uh, I'm Lubna Skarihana. Is this It's working? working. Yep. Okay. It has worked. Um, I'm from American University, um, SIS uh, School of International Service. Um, thank you all for um, this um, fascinating panel. Um, I am uh, particularly appreciative of the historical perspective. There is hardly anything we can do in the Middle East that would have meaning unless we put things in perspective that is historical, given the colonial legacies, given the complexities that Marina just talked about. So I think that history is absolutely central in how we try to understand what's going on right now and who are the players. What I would love to hear is how are all of these external players as well as internal tensions, how do they have impact on people on the ground? So we are what we are hearing are at the policy level, elite decisions, policy conversations, but these are important, um, these are important moves that have real and tangible impact on people on the ground. Even if at this moment, the US might not be clear in its motives and what it's doing, but I would like to argue that there is symbolic power given the historical context. Okay, we, we, uh, sorry, we, we can only, I'll, I'll, I'll take the question, okay? Sorry. We haven't got time for a longer comment, okay? So okay. Just, just a question and so then. So we'll the, qu the, the question pretty much is, um, what does this mean for people on the ground? What are we talking about the US as an external uh, actor or Europe, which has a huge also uh, sort of role in the region? Super, thank, thank you. you. Uh, another question? Yeah, and keep it short if you can, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Reynaldo Ortega from El Colegio Mexico. Just a quick question to Ron and, and to 
and to Victor and Pierre. In, in, in what sense um, it, is there a difference between the American way of uh, putting pressure on the countries and the European way of, of, of doing it? And, uh, it, and, and the, the, the follow-up is, uh, in what way a different international structure of power determines the type of regimes and responses that you're having. I mean, in a, a Cold War time, you have some kind of, of type of intervention. And, and that's also with the Polish question. If you, if you compare uh, before uh, the, cold, the end of the Cold War, what kind was the American pressure on, and after? And that's also correct to, to the Mexican case. I mean, I, th I think the international structures determine uh, the type of, inter uh, of intervention that you're going to have and the type of results. Super. And I'll take one more. Yep. Uh, Paul Canero from the Monk School and formerly at the World Bank. Um, I'm in violent agreement with Marina, and I guess I'll just throw out the point. If the transitions don't need Western money and the advice based on the models of the past has been bad, in terms of state building. We've got 30 years of experience that it's bad. What do the transitions need from the West, the North, however you want to frame it? Okay, great. Let's, let's start. Do you want to start with this one? Well, it's, uh, uh, I think what we see is, and I get uh, these talking to people at the IMF and the bank and so on, for example, but also, the, you know, my opinion. What they still need very often is technical advice. Uh, let me give you an example. All the countries of the transitions are facing this problem of reforming the system of subsidies. No, they, have, they are spending a huge amount of their budget on subsidies which are not targeted and so on. They know they have to change it because this is bleeding money out of the budget. It's unsustainable, essentially. They don't know how to do it. Not only they don't know how to do it, uh, I mean, they are afraid of tackling the issue for very good reasons, because this is an explosive issue, but they really don't know how to do it. And there is a lot that they need, and they are listening, I understand. When, uh, when organizations come and say, you know, this is the problem, this is the way such a country has tackled it, and these are some of the ways in which you can attempt and do it, and so on. That is certainly a very important part. I think it's true on a lot of issues, that in fact, if it is presented the right way, if it is not too intrusive, and so on, sometimes it has an impact. I have an example, the, the, uh, uh, the constitution writing in Egypt, uh, there was a young lawyer uh, that was seconded there by a Washington law firm to one non-profit organization. Just because, uh, an Egyptian-American, just because he was on the ground, he ended up by being consulted by members of the Constituent Assembly repeatedly, saying, you know, and this, is the, this was an assembly dominated by the Islamists, saying, how do other countries have tackled this particular aspect mm -hmm. of the Constitution? I think there is a lot more that can be done as long as it is not in your face because I think these are all countries that are very nationalistic. Uh, well, uh, basically uh, I will try to reply to uh, comments by, made by Reynaldo. I totally agree with your uh, characterization about this uh, situation concerning to the Mexican case. In the case of Mexico, more, more or less we, we could have a, a clear expression that uh, America uh, has uh, maybe two or possible, just one way to, uh, to deal with Mexico. No, it's uh, in a kind of soft power. In a, and this kind of soft power has been uh, strictly uh, reduced uh, into financial aspects because you know the the basic capacity as I want as I wanted to argue in the paper is that Mexico is still a very strong national uh, 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 structure in terms of the uh, capacity that uh, its political uh, its political elite uh, does have to cope with uh, media or some other uh, means to to reply to to external pressures basically the the case that i want to raise uh, concerning the external debt and the and the financial crisis there were the only gate uh, that the uh, united states uh, could have in uh, all, all over these years uh, in order to 
to to sustain a, a different relationship with Mexico. Uh, in the other in the other uh, areas, uh, I feel that Mexico is still having the chance of uh, being an uh, independent and very autonomous actor in international relations. So I, I think that this is something that we should keep in mind because, uh, for instance, now the agenda that it's uh, beginning to to be raised up uh, around, for instance, uh, drug uh, deal, uh, uh, dealing, drug trafficking, crime organization, and some other uh, 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 issues uh, much more related to, to this fact, is more, uh, I think, uh, uh, more concentrated than being a uh, considering a whole entire of recipes and a whole entire uh, set of uh, factors as uh, could find in, uh, for instance, in the African or the Asian or the Arab uh, uh, situation. And that's why, for instance, uh, I, I could say that uh, uh, if, if just I uh, want to point, uh, 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 yes, uh, just a simple comment. The impact in, in people in the common ground in Mexico, it's more or less, more or less the quite the same in other places. The, they don't want to be uh, an underdeveloped country. They want to look like you know, the horizon, so, so something like that. We, it, it was mentioned here before. Well, not mar notwithstanding if it's into the American way or into the uh, Western uh, idea, it just want to be a simple country which is capable to deal with its own problems into its own way. Okay. Sure. sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, I. I let me just say very, very fast, and hopefully we can discuss this more separately. To Lupna's question on external actors uh, impacting people on the ground, I think that's a terrific question. To be perfectly honest with you, I think since 1989, it's been a story of the slow disenchantment of Poles with, first and foremost, the United States, uh, but I think also a complicated relationship with the EU as a whole that has to do more with EU-related factors. It's interesting that I'm, I don't know if I'd trace this to the degree of engagement at the time or not, but Russia was important before. And this goes, takes me to Re Reinaldo's question about international structures of the time, right? The bipolar hegemonic model has pushed away. So as that's receded into memory, the conditions that made it important for people to care about the U.S. and to, ele I mean, a different way, Western Europe have slowly receded. Money's coming in. A standard of living is growing, uh, uh, c capacity, mobility, social mobility, physical mobility is up. It's becoming less and less important. One thing that I think has still remained very important and become even more important is this uh, issue of non-state actor networks, which is social integration, uh, professional integration, the kind of thing that was limited to a couple of social domains in the Cold War has exploded in relevance now. And that's really the single best way to create this kind of integration. That's also one place in which the U.S. was at, I mean, this is why George Bush was lost for the first half of 1989, because the immediate relevance of the U.S. started to disappear, uh, because there were social actors in other places in Europe who could compensate and actually do much more effectively what he had promised in general. And I think the changing place of NATO in the world has only really attested to that fact, right? To the extent that there was leverage before, Poles want visas now to the U.S. and they still don't have them. But that's not really a reason to be part of a coalition of the willing anymore, even though that was the justification given on the ground much of the time. I think the, the fascinating thing about your comment I, I would, is uh, something that comes out to me, just to sort of wrap up my thoughts, is almost what does the West need from the transitions is as much a lesson of this conversation as what the transitions need from the West, right? And I mean, in some sense, that's true also with the Eastern European cases, I think, because at, a, at the point at which the President of the United States no longer really knew what exactly he needed, besides, okay, they all joined NATO, the conversation stopped very quickly. And Brandon or Ron, do you want to comment on that? Well, I didn't, in my remarks, deal really with the intervention of external actors. But let me say, to, in the spirit of what this discussion has been, that in the Turkish case, that you can see the same phenomenon that you, uh, the two of you have de described about U.S. influence and intervention. Take the Azov reforms. The U.S. pushed very hard for these uh, reforms. It also didn't realize 
the implications that this would have for the uh, social and uh, political repercussions in the sense that, as I said, this unleashed a whole host of trends uh, that weren't expected and which changed uh, and accelerated the process of change in uh, Turkey. In the Cold War period, the United States had had a strong tie to the military, and that's how we generally thought uh, we handled our affairs. We went to the military, and this was the main vehicle. Uh, this changed uh, more, uh, uh, and what you saw was the U.S. not understanding the uh, how, as I said, these reforms to change the, the nature of politics in uh, Turkey, and that the military's role became less and less uh, important, and we continued, however, to see the military as the main uh, uh, actor and interlocutor. And just to give one example, when uh, in 2003, when the parliament uh, did not approve of the U.S. Uh, uh, opening up a second front and putting troops in, uh, coming in through Turkey, Wolfowitz, Paul Wolfowitz, then Deputy Secretary of Defense, was quoted as saying, the military didn't live up to their responsibility. Their responsibility, in his view, was to tell the politicians what to do and that they should do it. And the military, for reasons of their own, because they did not trust and like the AKP, and because most of the population was opposed uh, to the intervention of the United States. Therefore, the military wanted the AKP to f face an, uh, an up, uh, a wave of uh, protest from, it, from its constituents, and they expected that the uh, vote would be positive. And that, so therefore, they didn't want to intervene uh, and have anything do, to do with it. But the vote, of course, uh, unexpectedly didn't go the way the military, the AKP, or the United States uh, expected. But it shows you when he says they didn't live up to their responsibility, the mentality, uh, it which was very strong in the Pentagon because the Pentagon was dealing essentially with the military, and the political actors were far less important politicians. And briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, the question of impact on the ground with the CIA covert operations in Iraq, uh, the Americans absolutely, I think, are contributing to the political polarization uh, in Baghdad, heightening tensions, which they seem to be concerned about. Uh, so in fact, the unintended consequences, is it's actually making the situation far worse for American uh, interests. And again, it's Qasem who, uh, takes a step to sort of reestablish a political equilibrium, not because of American covert efforts, uh, I think in spite of American attempts uh, to try and remedy the situation. And the question of um, how the international system sort of dictates um, uh, external responses, I think with the Iraqi case study, um, the, the structure of the international system absolutely ne necessitated, in American view at least, a covert, res uh, covert response uh, from Washington because armed intervention was deemed to be too costly, too dangerous with the Soviet Union as possible, um, uh, Soviet po possible participation because the Americans are concerned about the battle for hearts and minds in the developing world. It is a covert uh, solution that they seek because covert intervention seemed to offer a cheap, uh, a cheap solution to political crises. It's quick. It's, uh, you know, these, these countries like Iraq seem to be vulnerable to external manipulation, and it also preserves plausible deniability for American officials so they can plausibly claim to have nothing to do with uh, uh, events going on in Iraq. So the covert uh, turn is absolutely, I think, a product of the international system. Likewise, just two, two quick uh, points. One, uh, with an eye to, to Ludwig's point, just, just an echo of, of something that, uh, that Piotr has, has started to talk about in, in terms of, of 
both past but even more and more uh, recent developments and another example of, of the stunning complexity of the, the situations we're dealing with, this emphasis on non-governmental actors, non-state actors, transnational movements and, and the like, uh, it, to, to look at what state actions produce in terms of impact of people on the ground could produce extremely different uh, results from a calculation of what's happening on the basis of other kinds of external actions, and I, and I think that's a very interesting dimension. It's true historically as well, but, but it becomes more and more so as, as we move along. On the systemic uh, is issues, and, and Reynaldo's uh, point, um, a, a stretch beyond uh, Brandon's observation as, as well. I, I, I'm thinking of, of the old Mark Twain line about, uh, about history, the observation, history may not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme a lot. Um, <laughs> And it, it, I think for all of the systemic changes that we are seeing, uh, one of the consistent patterns in terms of the, the nature of actions by external actors, particularly powerful external actors, we need to keep in mind that there's a lot of rhyming going on here. We are still talking about power uh, and the mechanisms by which power uh, is, is exercised as opposed to the objectives uh, for which it is uh, e exercised. I had just recently some fascinating discussions with Brazilians, for instance, about what's going on in the Arab Spring and the Libya uh, situation in, in, in particular, in which the Brazilians are extremely critical of what they freely describe as the quasi-imperial nature of external intervention in these situations. Um, I'm not sure that the language is totally appropriate, but the notion that you have great power actors seeking to influence the course of events within a very different looking system is, is a consistency. We're not dealing with an either or uh, change here at, at all. And you know, follow the power, follow the attempts to exercise the power uh, is, is uh, a, a, a worthwhile device. For all of the change, some clear uh, consistency. And if that isn't ever spoken like a historian, I don't know what to <laughs> Thank you so much. On that note, we will round it up. Let me thank our most warmly, our panelists today, uh, Mike Chick, who wasn't here, of course, Piotr, uh, Victor, Stephen, and uh, Brandon and Ron for their wonderful presentations. And really, this is uh, food for thought for the discussion that's going to lead into the afternoon, where we have another panel starting at, at 1 o'clock on the role of women and youth. Uh, let me thank all of you for making time in your schedules to come this afternoon. Uh, or this morning, and I uh, hope to see you again this afternoon. So this lunch, I think, is being served. Yeah, let me just thank uh, Michael for uh, missing out the State Department lunch to make this uh, <laughs> shared a session here today. And I think we ought to start up at 1.15, Ron. Sure. You think that the afternoon panel will have another minute. Yeah, we'll start at 1.15 sharp in this room. Lunch is right outside. Thank you. Thank you.